We're proud to have Lawrence Landeloos on our stage. Lawrence is the founder and venture lead at Web3 innovator OneGrid. With OneGrid, Lawrence empowers brands and artists in building interactive, rewarding and highly engaging fan experiences. He helps brands and artists in releasing exclusive digital items, content and experiences, creating new ways to monetize their work and forge a more exclusive connection with fans. With more and more people living a larger part of their life in cyberspace, Lawrence is the go-to expert to tap into this new reality. And Lawrence has a vast knowledge of the insurance industry as well. Please welcome Lawrence Landeloos. Okay, hello, hello. What an intro, thank you. Okay, so yeah, I'm Lawrence, nice to meet you. And I have the pleasure the coming 20 minutes to actually talk about digital identity, or better, the quest for our digital identity. And I took the privilege to show this fabulous image that you see at the back, which is, fun fact, actually a bar in the US that was so fed up with all these college students coming to the bar with fake IDs, trying to buy alcohol, that he eventually decided to put all the seized IDs covered over the bar and over the tables. Not sure if that's legal, but anyway. So this is me, as you can see, obviously not ordering a drink. But I'm not sure if you've seen the last year that LinkedIn has introduced this functionality of verification. And verification, it's a big thing. It's a big topic. And the reason is why does LinkedIn in the last year rolls out these type of functionalities, right? And they're existing for 20 years. And if you look at the last report in 2023, the first six months of LinkedIn, they had to stop more than 57 million fake account creations by bots which is obviously a big problem if you think about fraud, scam, misinformation, right? And it's not only LinkedIn who has this problem. I'm not sure if everybody followed the process of Mr. Musk acquiring the Twitter, currently X, where there was a debate about how much of the user base is real and fake, and which one was initially defined 5%. Independent research has shown that one in 5% of the user base is actually a fake false account. And he realized quite quickly that something has to be done in the advancements of AI. That's been, of course, a lot talked about today as well. And to redesign this verification system to show who is real and who isn't. And a lot of social media platforms followed these steps. Eventually, you had Meta, who decided to do a verification for Facebook, but Instagram. But it's not only the, so the social giants who decided to counter this problem. Also this pro person. I'm aware that everybody knows who he is, Sam Altman, CEO and founder of OpenAI. And what you maybe don't know is four years in, in the development of the AI models, he decided to start a new venture called Tools for Humanity. And Tools for Humanity has a whole ethos saying that eventually we will achieve some sort of artificial general intelligence, AGI, which will, of course, change how the internet works. The question is, we will absolutely need a human gate, a way to only define what's human and what's not human for our future. So we need more sophisticated tools of authentication, not just the traffic lights or the annoying bikes or the checkbox of agreeing indeed you are not a robot. No, you need a new type of humaneness, what they call in AI. And it's not, love, not enough talk about this, in my perception. And they saw two ways to achieve this, one way, was a more large-scale, you can even argue, global-enforced, governmental-enforced KYC, which is pretty hard to do, or we will develop our own identity protocol. And they launched WorldCoin, a quite controversial, also experimental venture. And the base of WorldCoin is this orb. 
And this orb is actually a biometrical device. And this device allows you to scan your eyes, to scan your iris, and transform this biometrical data in a string that perfectly defines who you are. And what it does, this string will be translated in what they call eventually your world ID, your global passport. And why do they do this? Well, this passport allows you to connect to those platforms and ideally identify you as a human being. Now, I don't need to explain to you the importance of fake and real. And just a very small example, I'm not sure if you're aware of this person, little Michaela, but she's actually not real. And there is a huge growth in these virtual influencers, especially with the generative tools that AI provide us. And you can imagine how difficult it will be that currently it's still operated by humans, but what eventually if it's a bot? What could influence the communication and how could it influence eventually our behavior? Now, on the other side, they saw another opportunity. They saw WorldCoin as a way to provide those people who don't have a digital verified identity to give them a tool to have so. Even better, there are around 800 million people who don't have a formal ID in regions of the world, but they do have 60% of them access to a SIM card of mobile to the internet. This could also for them provide a solution to be online. Now, it's not only the states and the tech gurus and people who develop these type of solutions. And in Europe, there's also a lot of thinking about this issue. Um, there's a quote of Ursula von der Leyen, which is true. She says, it's, we're urgently in need to also develop a digital passport, a European digital passport. And the reason is, every time we log into a platform, we give our email, password, address, phone number, we actually don't really know what's happening with that data, right? And her ID, or the ID of the initiative is, what if we provide everyone this UI passport? It's almost like a vault where all the relevant records, your personal information, your security information, will be captured, and it will be completely in your own control, not within these different platforms. And this is part of a larger program, and you could debate successful or not, but the initiative was to de develop the European blockchain services infrastructure with the whole goal that if we are going to build a pan-European identity, which we could use across platforms, wouldn't it be smart to not have one central entity, country, person to control it, but have a decentral servers who keep each other in check which makes it hard to control and manage your data. And the idea of portability, which I briefly mentioned, in Belgium, there's already quite a successful um, startup, scale up, you could call it, called It's Me, which allows you now to connect with governmental portals, even to private websites, and connect your ID, not by giving an email, not giving a password, but through this wallet. And it will directly show all the information that this platform is requesting from you. The first time, at least for a lot of people, they're having the experience of owning your personal data instead of logging your data. And it goes broader than this, right? The whole idea is what if we could have one vault, our own database, where also our insurance statements will be verified and encrypted in, or bank information, even our medical records. You can go very far, but what if we can have this, control this, and decide at any time how much information we want to share? And it's not only the philosoph philosophical idea of ownership, which is abstract, but there's also a lot of efficiency. I'll give you an example. A year, year and a half ago, uh, I moved to Spain, Madrid. Well, I had to follow, follow my wife, at least. And there was a question of, okay, we need to rent out our apartment on Airbnb. And we were very fortunate to go through the amazing process of requesting a touristic license, which starts with having your energy and gas certificate swapped out to get a fire safety security certificate. Once you have that, you can send it over to another body where you ask for an official urban planning certificate. 
Then as a third, you go to another government body where you will ask your criminal records that they pull out of the databases and send in a PDF. And then it doesn't stop there. They request you to, um, you request to send up other information, like, for example, your insurance records. You have to go to the broker, ask your civil li liability insurance. You also ask um, additional ID information you have, so we had to take pictures of our ID. And all that info, all these PDFs you send to a mail to the last p station, the tourist office, will, that then will exchange to you a signed paper that you can indeed rent out. And it, you can imagine if all this info in your journey will be recorded in your own vault, how much easier it is at that point to just share that with a touristic office, instead of having all these mandates, hours, and inefficiencies of sending papers back and forth. And there are some players in the market, I just highlight a few who are moving in, there's quite a lot of them actually. Belgium, for example, KBC, they're experimenting a little bit with this digital vault, safety vault. But you also have the consortium of notaries who recently launched their own private secure vault with your real estate deeds, but also all your private info that after you would pass away, it would only be shared with the people that you want. So I highlighted a lot about digital identity and what this actually could mean, but it's broader than that. It's not just your digital twin of your real life. It's also your online, the representation of your online presence, your online status, your online reputation, and that's often not seen by a lot of people. And I'll take an example, it has to do with everything you do on social media, where you build up recognition, the comments, the likes, your following, which we call the social graph, as well as the blogs and articles you exchange. Right? And it's not just a simple platform or data point. People give money for this. People buy followers for reputation and they buy likes. People buy blog profiles, this is an example of Reddit, to have credibility in some of these forums. People buy usernames, just like domain names, on auctions, on very high prices, that would add to their personal reputation. And you could then ask if all that information has a monetary value, well, shouldn't we also think about ownership in this space? Should we also think about how we can control this information more instead of having it spread and managed by other platforms? And you see this question and fear in the creator economy a lot, the influencers who actually live off these platforms and the small businesses. They are very afraid of deplatforming, being locked out of the account, losing followers. It's almost their world in a sense. And it happens more than you think. I'm not an influencer, I have barely followers, I should have more though. But this is an example of me, the first year in of OneGrid. I made an account on Twitter, X, um, of course, to promote the business. And I made a small mistake by um, changing the year of my profile. I thought it was how long the business existed. Apparently it's my age. And if you're under 12, you kind of get kicked out. I lost this account. You have no clue how long it took me to get it back. The right picture is current. I still don't have it back. For me, it's not a problem. But if that's your whole entity, your business, your profile, where you worked on, this might influence and impact more than you could, you could think. And you see gradually a movement in this direction. For example, Jack Dorsey, who recently released an, a new type of social protocol called Blue Sky and AT Protocol, you can have the option to or choose the servers and the database of the platform, or bring your own. And the idea is if you bring your own, the following, the people that you connect with, become part of your own vault, and all these developers that build applications on top of that infrastructure, you could switch between. You get kicked out of one, you could use the other one. The communication, just like email, stays direct. And the big legacy giants are following the same thinking. Here you have Threads, which is a counter to Twitter in a sense, where they openly communicate that their vision is to foster communication and to not control this information on their own servers. But this is all 2D. 
If you go in a more immersive environment, you can imagine that your virtual self will have more dynamism. There will be more parts that become important. And we see this clearly at Roblox. Not sure if everybody knows Roblox, but it's actually a social virtual space. Some call the metaverse, some not, as a game. Where they did a surveying of all Gen Zs, and they asked how important their styling is, and then most of them said, 56%, that the presence, their status, a representation of their avatar is more important than how they represent themselves in real life. And as an example, this Adidas necklace, which is last week sold for $20,000, is just a virtual item, exclusive virtual item, that you can dress up your avatar with. So it's not just a data point again. It's a real surgeon of a new asset class. Some that is sometimes a bit misunderstood. And actually, to be fair, I haven't thought about Web3 and blockchain too much, but this is the only premise that Web3 wants to move forward with. It's just stating that if all these online assets become as important as our real life records that we bring online, shouldn't we have some sort of property rights ownership that we can take with us across the different platforms? Digital art, fashion, member cards. And it's growing as a trend. Last year, 25% growth of the daily active users in Roblox. And you see brands leaning into extensively, not only as a game, but like IKEA now, also recruiting people to work in their virtual shops and pay for. And to take a very extreme example, you have China that is gradually thinking about how can we link your virtual self with your physical self, which is dangerous, of course, because everything you do in the virtual, virtual space, in their eyes, should also influence the credit score system that you have in the real life, as you know, their credit card scoring um, system. And there has been a lot of talk about you know, attacks in metaverse, about you know, harassments in this space, and they want to mitigate it through the system. So what I want to make as a point is this virtual self and this real self is growing together. And if I talk about digital identity, it's not just an identity card. It's having that vault, that information combined that you can own and move around. And this, of course, brings the questions. Like, who will own that data? On which infrastructure do we build? One party or a more decentralized technology that keeps everybody in check? And what do we do with cyber attacks when all this information becomes so important online? What if we have identity theft? How impactful could that be? And how could that influence us? And these are questions you see gradually also insurers play around with to think about, OK, maybe we should think about these social profiles and these assets. And maybe we th should think about these digital items that have some sense and some value. Or maybe we could really move through your own physical wallet, that you control everything almost in a physical device and only connect these data points by signing off or through biometrical data. Who knows? So I want to wrap up this more philosophical idea of digital identity with a quote of Balaji Srinivasan, which I do admire his work for a while. He talks about the network state, this new virtual space. And he says eventually, in the future, we will all have our own money, our own data, our own information, our own servers. And the future will be a set of options that eventually will lead to complete independence of the individual. Thank you very much. <laughs>